you know, these these guys, you know, were my friends. I I feel so betrayed. How could they try and change what our word was? All the manipulation and the lies. By editing a feature film, it was a shock to me. Shocking to hear that my friends lied to me in my face. It's just absurd. It's absurdity. And they know that. <coughs> Everyone knows that. In 1996, a feature-length movie called Don's Plum was made. <laughs> it starred the so-called Pussy Posse, a circle of celebrity friends including Leonardo DiCaprio, Tobey Maguire, and Kevin Connolly. Considering the star power, Don's Plum seemed destined for success. But shortly after its completion, multiple lawsuits were filed, and DiCaprio and Maguire successfully banned the film's release in America and Canada. For years, the full story of Don's Plum has gone untold. How it destroyed friendships. I feel so betrayed. Ruined Hollywood careers. That is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard in my life. Instigated divorces, and even caused a producer to contemplate suicide. Now, the New York Post brings you the truth behind this salacious story. So the fight happens right there. That's, that's a, an iconic moment for me. Relax! Whatever you guys are fighting about, relax, bro. It's right here where they hug and they say, in 10 years, man, in 10 years, none of this is going to matter. So whatever this is all about, 10 years from now, you know what I'm saying? And in 20 years, he's still wrong. Probably two weeks after the bashing, uh, we had gotten a letter from Leo's lawyer uh, telling, telling us that we did not have the secured rights to release the film. And then we had heard from Miramax that they had to withdraw their offer. Everything just fell like dominoes. But then after a couple of weeks, I started to really uh, feel the effects of what was happening to me socially. And that's when I started realizing that, that I was shunned even amongst my friends. You know, there's like one moment when I went to go to see a movie at the Beverly Center, and then I ran into Vani, Giovanni Ribisi. And Giovanni Ribisi and myself, Artie Rob, we were close, we hung out a lot. Every time prior to that day that I had seen Vani, we would embrace, we would hug, we would say what's up, we would have a conversation. So intuitively, when I saw him that day, I just went in for a hug. What's up, Vani? And I put my arms around him and he, he just stood there limp. He wouldn't hug me back. It was so bizarre. We would go to parties and just people who would normally be ex extremely happy to see me, just they wouldn't even speak to us. You know, the word, the word on the street is it go back to me. You work with those guys, you will never work with Leonardo DiCaprio. Then things started really going kooky. And, um, you know, everything that was normal uh, ceased to be. The next thing I knew, Jerry and Stutman and RD and Dale all declared that they're gonna sue Leo because Leo's blocking this thing and I didn't want to sue them. Up until that point, nobody would even nobody would take our case because Leonardo DiCaprio wasn't really worth all that much money. Leonardo DiCaprio was not a big star. Leonardo DiCaprio in Hollywood was somebody that we all knew was going to become a big star. But at that time, as a matter of fact, Leo DiCaprio, as the star of a film, had, an, I think, an accumulated box office of under $5 million attributed to his name. Total. But then, Titanic. And then it becomes the biggest film of all time. It was like torture for me. I mean, it was everywhere. It was everything. There was nowhere I could turn, look, or be where I wasn't being showered in Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, Leo is worth a ton of cash, 
All of a sudden, Burt Fields, one of the biggest litigators in entertainment history, agrees to take the case. The lawsuit hit on April 1st. It was Stutman versus DiCaprio and McGuire. Jerry and Nardi and myself were listed as additional plaintiffs in the original lawsuit. We have worked continuously since 1996 to try and find an amicable solution to this dispute. I didn't want it to come to this. Already there was this sort of desperate greed um, that was, was driving everything. I think especially for Stuntman it was on a personal level because he had always projected this image of being this thing. But had never really been able to prove that he's this thing. So if he gets this, then he is this thing. Greedy desperation is, is the best way that I can put it. My goal has always been and remains to give everyone the opportunity to see Don's plum on the big screen. There wasn't a news outlet that didn't cover it. Everybody covered it. Everybody. All the TV shows of the time, Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, all of the big magazines ran stories. It was everywhere. All of a sudden, Leo and Toby were countersuing them. And the, but they didn't sue me because I didn't sue them. Now I'm not involved in the suit. Suddenly, a cloak of security is put up. Now I can't even find out what happened to my elements, which they came and seized out of my house as evidence. So even with my attorney, I could not find out what happened to the lawsuit or to my movie. Do you feel you were blacklisted? Well, yeah, absolutely I was blacklisted at the time. Did you eventually go and make more movies? No. I really wanted no part in <laughs> bringing a lawsuit or even trying to make this a feature film because it had become clear that this is not what the actors wanted. And so, I mean, there was a point in which Dave pretty much just cut me out of everything. And I mean, that's around the time Dave and I I'll just start stopped talking. I, you know, I moved on with my life. Burt Fields took, the, took on the case. He believed it was gonna settle quickly because he believed that this looked bad for Leo and that it would, it would only get worse if he, if he didn't settle. So he, he was certain, was Burt Fields, that we were gonna end up in a quick settlement and that this thing was gonna go away. And uh, boy, was he wrong. We get contacted from Dateline. Stone Phillips wants to do a story on Don's Plum. And Leo finds out and he freaks out. Again, Leo's still very afraid of the press at this point. We get a call saying that if we agree not to do the Dateline piece, uh, they want to go in and talk settlement. So we were happy to, to, to accommodate. We were like, yeah, absolutely, let's get to a settlement agreement. We get into the settlement conference, and one of the first things out of Leonardo DiCaprio's mouth was, all right, guys, I know things have changed since Titanic. And I just, it just got me off on the wrong foot straight away. I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean things have changed? He's like, well, I know that I'm not the same as I was. And I was like, why? I understand you had a hit movie. What's, what's different? I don't understand what's going on. It was not the same dude, man. I was like, who the f are you? We went back and forth. There was a banter. It was kind of like the argument around the table in Don's Plum. Like this and that, and a little bit of he said, she said. And Toby started to boil up as he does. He has this, he's very quick tempered about us betraying Leo. Now, I want to be clear about this. In our second shoot, it was a feature film. Toby Maguire, even according to his own testimony under, under oath, knew when he came to shoot the film, it was a feature film. We have enough to cut something over 70 minutes, or I, I don't remember what, 80 minutes. There's no way that that can be a feature film. It's always intended to be a short. Then I turned to Toby and I was like, Toby, if I betrayed Leonardo DiCaprio, then you betrayed Leonardo DiCaprio too. There's no other way to look at it. And Toby freaked. It was like life imitating art at this point. It was like that scene in Don's Plum where Toby's character just snaps. He lost it, which I was so excited about because we jumped to our feet and we were about to go. And let me tell you, man, I wanted to. I have never like assaulted somebody with my fists. Oh my God. I wanted to so bad. All these like lawyers rushing, what's going on? What's going on? We're screaming, are you mother I'm gonna kill you. And it's just chaos. 
Relax. And then finally we agree to reassemble and talk again. I come into the room and there's Leo sitting next to Toby. And he's just rubbing his leg the way you would rub like your lover's leg. And he's almost whispering, it's okay. It's okay, Toby. It's okay. And Toby's still sitting there steaming, you know? And I'm looking at these two guys. And I'm like, these are not the friends I once knew. So in the end, uh, there were just too many clashes in that settlement. We couldn't come to any kind of an agreement. And Bert Fields decided that he had had enough, no mas, and he dropped us. Now we gotta find a new lawyer. We end up finding a new lawyer, and then eventually we got to the point where we could get another settlement uh, conference. I went into that settlement conference in a pretty dark mood because I knew that there was a good chance we were gonna get taken advantage of in this situation because there was so much leverage against us. Our only goal with the lawsuit was to get our movie back. And our ultimate goal with the settlement was to just get Don's Plum released. The settlement went on for so long, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The main argument during the settlement was on territories. Obviously, Leo and Toby did not want the film to come out in the US and Canada, which was enough to cripple us. In addition to that, Leo, in particular, did not want the film to come out in Japan. One of the things we fought for in that room that night with our attorneys and Leo and Toby was Asia. He was huge in Japan, Japan long, long, long before he was big in America. He got a Hyundai commercial or something like that in Japan. Makeruna, kimitachi. I remember this, man. They flew his ass to Japan. Shiro, Ichigo. He worked for two days. He got $3 million in two cars. You can't underemphasize the Japanese market enough. It was the key market with respect to this film. So we finally came to an agreement at something like one o'clock in the morning. We finally win the rights to Japan, but not the US and Canada. Nope, still banned. We're exhausted at this point in the evening and we feel like we've agreed to most of the main issues. And then the mediator walks in, he's got a long list of cuts that Leo and Toby want us to make in order to release the film. The first one was for Ian, played by Toby. It's the scene where all the group is sitting around the table and they're talking about masturbation. You know what? I beat off and I stick my pinky. <laughs> in your ass? <laughs> Not in my ass, but... Around the table. Ah! I mean, I do it. And then, you know what? It makes it way better. And then the other came from Derek, played by Leo. Derek describes that men have five orgasmic spots in our you have four orgasmic spots on your, in your And then he goes on to say that's why gay guys yeah. like rabbits. I can only guess that they felt like it was either too salacious or maybe too revealing. So the settlement that we, we ended up agreeing on was terrible for us. We lost the US, we lost Canada, and on top of that, Don's Plum was responsible for all the legal bills for the entire litigation, which amounted to at least $2 million at the time. It was a terrible deal, but we were left with no choice, so we signed the deal. Signing the settlement was a bittersweet experience, but at least finally it was over, and we had our movie back. So, and we were like, let's go sell it. One of the first companies to express interest in Don's Plum was Lars von Trier's Zentropa Studios. And on a plane we went to Denmark to finish Don's Plum finally and forever. In Denmark, man, I'm working myself to death. And we got some really great news. We got accepted into the 2001 Berlin Film Festival. And our DNI were like, okay, you know, it started to feel like, really started to feel like the end and that the new beginning was really happening. It started to feel like, okay, here we go. My film's gonna be in one of the biggest, most prestigious festivals on the planet Earth and it was a long time coming. And I get this email from my lawyer. And she says, congratulations on Berlin. You're going to be dealing with the press. She said, you guys are bound by an NDA, an undisclosure agreement, and, uh, and a settlement. And so you should only say the following and you should not deviate from this whatsoever. We are so glad that we are able to put the Don's Plum dispute behind us amicably, and we look forward to releasing the film to the rest of the world. And that was the only two things we could say. At a press conference in Berlin, Rob and his producer David Stutman would only say the dispute was settled amicably. David and I have, have both been through so much of this and really, I mean, we're here to celebrate the film itself and I'd really like to talk about the film. <laughs> We've uh, amicably agreed on a settlement and all parties are happy to put this misunderstanding behind them. When I got the email, 
about Berlin and in the email it says, man, don't say anything else because if you say anything else, you know what's gonna happen. I knew at that moment I was doomed. And like, this breaks my heart to this day, man. I was afraid to go to my own premiere because I was afraid I was gonna say something that was gonna get me sued. And we had the anticipation of maybe making some money finally and digging myself out of the incredible financial hole that I had been dug into through this whole litigation. And I was like, oh, man, I'm gonna finally make some money. And then I go there and I say one stupid thing and it's just gonna all go away. So instead of going to the premiere of my movie, I just took my wife, we got on a plane, and at the very time, at the very moment that Don's Plum was premiering for the first time at the Berlin Film Festival, I was on a carriage with my wife. So sad, I was so sad. But I was on this little carriage and we were just getting pulled through the cobble streets of Rome. And, and it was soothing, but man, I was sad. And then something awful happened. Surprising, I know. So this big Japanese distributor is offering us $1.2 million and Jerry's like, well, I'm gonna take a stab and see if I can get a little more. I'm gonna call Gaga, the other big distributor, the other giant distributor in Japan, Gaga International. Jerry calls up Gaga and Gaga says, oh no, we already have the rights to this movie. What? What? And then we learn that way back in 1996, David Stepman sent a memo to Gaga International and it was confirming an offer they had made for $175,000 for the territory of Japan. And here's the thing, right? It wasn't a contract at all. It was literally a memo, one-sided memo, written from David Stopman to Gaga Entertainment. Not even signed by Gaga, nobody countersigned anything. It's just saying he wants to do a deal with them. After all the legal <laughs> happened, Stopman told me that he called up uh, Gaga and said, hey, listen, just so you know, <laughs> hit the fan, there's no deal. And then years later, Gaga comes out of the goddamn woodwork with this stupid memo that David Stutman sent. And through some miracle arbitration, Gaga wins the Japanese rights for $175,000. The prize we thought we had was gone, that there, there was no distribution for us that we had anticipated. The deal I'd worked so hard to make in Asia, the relationships I cultivated for the entire time we were making Don's Plum had now gone up in smoke and we would have had three million dollars from Asia. And that wasn't where it ended. It set off a huge domino effect and every distributor just started dropping their rates once they learned that Japan was going for $175,000. Utterly devastating. The money just started to disappear, man. Don's Plum ended up being released in several countries around the world, including Japan. Uh, it was released in all over Europe, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Spain. It was also released in Russia. So then the profits started coming, and of course the majority of them went to the lawyers, literally millions of dollars. My one and only check from Don's Plum uh, came shortly after the sales were complete. It was for $180. $180. Years of my life. I produced a feature film with the biggest movie star in the world and I got paid $180. You know, sadly I had to cash that check. I should have kept it, but I was literally broke when I got it. So I was like, 180 bucks, groceries, you know what I mean? If there's been any more money since then, I have no way of knowing what the sales on Don's Plum are or even if someone is intelligently handling it. And the truth is that Don's Plum is still making money to this day. And to this day, I've still only earned $180. The making of the movie was marvelous. Not making money for making it sucks. They say time flies, huh? Um, between 2002 and 2014, to me, it feels like a big blur. It just feels like, like it barely even happened. I was living a life that, um, a life I, I, I dreaded for the most part. Um, uh, I was a salesman for a good chunk of that time. I lived in a sentence uh, handed down by these two kids who had way too much power. My marriage suffered greatly from this uh, debacle. So the marriage fell apart by 2010 and I met a girl. Uh, she heard my story and, um, and then she started reading some of my old work and she was blown away. She loved Don's Plum, she loved my work, she believed I should be working and she suddenly became my my angel, man, she was like. 
She was like, I'm gonna get you working, man. We're gonna get you back. She had taken this story that I had been working on for so long to this giant producer. And she came home and she sat there at the table and she said, he loved it. He's gonna help. I mean, you can find this surprising, but I just, I just started crying. I just started to cry. I felt like, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, this is like just another time where I was like, there's still hope. Well, the next meeting, he learned who I was. He was like, oh, I remember this movie. It got, it got stopped because the agents thought it was crap or like it was just not good enough. And Angela tried to correct him. She did her best as delicately as she could. This is a very powerful producer, so she wasn't rude about it. But she was like, you know, that's not entirely the story, etc. And they said, well, whatever the case, I can't, I can't get involved in this project. I can't work with Dale. I can't get on the wrong side of Leo. Angela was like, but you're a multi-billion dollar producer. Like, clearly you're more powerful than Leonardo DiCaprio. And he shook his head and he said, no, man, nobody's more powerful than Leo. And I'm standing again in the rubble of Don's Plum. I, I, I think I had a moment where I was like, it's, it's just never gonna end. They're never gonna stop. They're constantly gonna destroy me. They have to do it. I, I think I was at my worst and, um, and I was really having a hard time coping. You know, thoughts of suicide again and all that craziness. I decided I gotta speak out. I gotta do something. Um, I can't just sit and, and die here. Uh, and so I decided uh, that I would write an open letter to Leonardo DiCaprio, admonishing him for what he's done and, and finally telling my side of the story publicly, which had never been heard. It was very difficult to do. Um, reliving this and writing this has been incredibly hard on me, but I felt like I got to punch the bully in the face. I felt like I got to hit him back. I felt like I got to stand up for myself for once. It amazes me that people have lived their whole life in which Don's plum is like the major, major catalyst for how their life turned out. RD, Dale, and Stuntman would really talk about it as if it was this incredible piece of beauty that was being robbed from the world. And it's not. Like, I never even thought it was even a great film. Like, it's a fun film. It's like, it is a perfect example of like 90s independent filmmaking. Black and white and a lot of talking. The American cultural landscape has not been robbed because some people haven't seen it. I think it's absolutely insane that we're still talking about this film 20 years later. I really don't give a f Years later, my father had lost a lot of money and he was trying to get back money he was owed. And so, you know, he remembered that David Stutman never paid back his loan for Don's Plum ever. So my father sued him. Stutman didn't show up for court, not once. So a default judgment was awarded to my father. The judge gave my father all of the rights, materials, ownership of Don's Plum. To my knowledge, the current owner of Don's Plum is my father. The inventor of the Happy Meal. The inventor of the Happy Meal, yeah. What's the future of Don's Plum? Do you have any plans? What, what are you going to do with it now? What I wanted to do was, uh, you know, try and have a, get a meeting with Leo and Toby and take the actual canisters there and, like, in a trash can, light them on fire and just burn those reels to the ground.